Well, Grandma, yes, good, good to have you on the show. Oh, wonderful to be here. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I think we, um, you and I, are like very similar minded, um, despite the age gap. Um, but uh, I've always wanted to like pick your brain, and I think you know we have both of a you know, deep fascination in spirituality and and you know the big questions and things. But I think it's always good to, and we we're talking about this before. But it's always so good to, um, you know, when we do get a chance to connect, um, to really make the most of it. So this this whole show is just like a good opportunity for you to tell me about your life. <laughs> so it'll be fun. It'll be really fun. Um, and I think as well, you know, you're a great role model for everyone in the family because you're 89 and you feel 26, as I said. Um, you look around 70, you know, maybe even less. And um, I just think you have an incredible approach to life, you know, in terms of happiness, um, you know, the right nutrition, um, you know, training the mind and, you know, social outings and things like that. So mm -hmm. I'm very, very excited to pick your brain. <laughs> that was lovely to hear, Tom, that one so young has such a, a, a lovely opinion of once <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's inspiring because I think that, um, you know, like I was saying before, you know, at the end of life, it, I think what we all want to do is be able to look back on life and go, I, I really made the most of it there. I don't have many regrets. The regrets that I do have, I made, I turned them around and made them into positives. And, you know, I've, I really um, squeezed the lemon, as they say. And I think you have and are doing that. So, As you've yeah. mentioned that, quite often I've reflected on this, how you behave today, tomorrow, that's history. Mm. So it's so important to concentrate on your behaviour at every moment of every day, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. But it's interesting, yeah, like it's so interesting to me, you are just like full of wisdom, right? <laughs> but, you, but you had all this wisdom at a time when it wasn't going around. So like, I don't classify myself as overly you know incredible or anything yet because i've just been born in an age where information is so easily accessible you know i can just jump on google and, and type in because i know how to use a computer obviously and just type in you know how to find meaning or what is happiness and then just hours of podcasts and videos on youtube and books to read like i just i can get the information but you were telling me was it 18 when you when you started only eating fruits and vegetables? A teenager, late teenager, teenager yes. Right. I read it in a book yes. that 80% um, of your diet should be raw fruit and vegetables. Now, yeah. you were, that was 1949. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> See, this is, that's what's even crazy to me, yeah. you know, and then the fact that you just stuck with that. Yeah. What, what do you think was yeah, that? That was a factor I was thinking of. It. I read it and took notice. Yeah. I didn't just forget it and think, oh, that's interesting and just go on. I read it, took notice... And then I was in a position to do it. As I mentioned to you this morning, if I'd had, um, if I wasn't living alone, I couldn't have done it because you've got to fit in with the family arrangements. You don't want to isolate yourself by cutting up salads and eating them yeah. while everybody else is tucking into a roast lamb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, uh, um, circumstances indicated what I could do mm. by living alone. Yeah, and it, it's just at a time, you know, I live in an age now where people are starting to question social norms and having a different look at things. Critical thinking is starting to really manifest itself, you know, to a large degree in a productive way. There are some people that take it too far, as you know, as is life. But um, your life from the sounds of things, especially in that era, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, was very regimented, like like there is a God. If, if you say there's no God, you're going to hell. You have to eat breakfast. If you're a woman and you're not married with a kid by 25, then you are going to hell and this and this and you're not right. Like, I'm just so interested in, you know, how you were able to, um, you know, dance to, to your own beat sort of thing, you know? Yeah. What, what do you think led you to do that? I think it's an individual personality. We're, we're, we're born with, we inherit certain characteristics, both physically and intellectually or mentally, from our parents, but we all develop in different ways so a lot of it is like with me my good health is definitely genetic on both sides of my family my grandparents lived to be uh, well my parents into his uh, one parent into it mid 80s my mother and two grandparents um into their 90s mm. so there's that longevity 
in my DNA. Mm. Yeah. That's very French of you, Grandma. <laughs> Longevity. <laughs> Well, that's how you pronounce yes, it. Yes, no, you're right, you're right. You, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you wouldn't pronounce it if you're doing it phonetically, you'd think it'd be long evity. Yes, and, yes. Yeah, yeah. And that's an, I've always been interested in semantics. That's mm. the umbrella topic. And, and to get, when I'm in conversation, to be thinking all the time, to, to use the word with the exact shade of meaning mm. that you want. Yeah. So you've always just been like a curious person. Mm. Yeah. When you were talking earlier, I thought the word for me, and I was criticised for it when I was young, it's all cerebral. Everything that's going on in the mind, you know, being philosophical, thinking things through. Mm. And, and, and lately, since I've retired, it's all to do with words you know, oh, and really? semantics. Uh, and I do crossword puzzles to enhance my... Uh, my knowledge of different word meanings and so forth. Yeah. And the cryptic it, ones particularly because of the quirky nature of them. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And, and it, it, it always just sounds to me like you were never doing any of these things for a specific reason other than the fact that you actually just enjoy them. Mm. Like you, you, you enjoy eating healthily. You know, yeah. you enjoy doing crossword. It's, it's like almost lucky in a way that you enjoy things that just so happen to be very good for you as well. Eating healthily has a good outcome. Yeah. I mean, I know all the nutrients that get by the food I eat. We know what we have to have a certain amount of fat, carbohydrate and sugar. Is that the other Protein. One? Protein, yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, I've read so much about it. It just makes sense to mm. buy the food that provides you with all these nutrients that you mm. need. I, I do things because they're they're sensible, mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas a lot of other people, well, a lot of people I know would like to do things that are exciting or or different or something like that. I think I'm too... Uh, well, when I was young, I used to be called plain Jane and no-nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a rebel out there making waves. Or that. I was just quietly doing things. But you're the so, you're yeah. the tortoise in many ways because yes. you probably outlived a lot of those people. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> They're all racing ahead and getting... Get over yeah. hills tumbling over, and I'm quietly coming up behind them. Yeah, <laughs> it, absolutely. So, yeah. what was your childhood like then? So, because you were born in February 31. That's right. 1931. 10th of February, 1931. Yeah. yeah. Well, the first thing I have, uh, I, I've thought about this long before you asked me to do the podcast. I, I've always had, I was one of, uh, I had three sisters, I'm one of four girls, and we're, we're an average of 15 months apart. Like we used to call them in those days, steps and stairs. Mm. And uh, I always had this sense of belonging. Mm. Yeah. And uh, George, um, my sister and I were all born at the height of the Depression. The Depression was from 29 uh, to 32. And, you know, my, uh, on the second one, I was born in the beginning of 31. And then had the two younger sisters. And, um, yes, yeah, so I've always had that sense of belonging having a, a parents who looked after me and in my knowledge of what goes on in the world as I got older I realized how precious that is mm. Mm. to to know there's a word for it that I can't think of now to know where you fit in yeah. in the world mm -hmm. well it sounds and like with loving parents mm. because these days there are a lot of dysfunctional families mm -hmm. yeah I think is the word you're looking for just having a home yes yeah. yes in every sense of the word, a sense. warm, cosy nest yeah. where you belong. Mm. And with um, nowadays, it's um, the the nuclear family. You know, um, I think it's um, one point five to or something on average. But there were a lot of oh, families yeah. in my in my day. Yes, yeah. yes. And of course, being Catholic. Very true. Very true. Very large family. Yes, it would be very uncatholic to not have a large <laughs> exactly. family. Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's just incredible. You know, I mean, I've only read about. Yes. the depression and yeah. who you are like living through it yes. because Australia um, kind of went through it uh, after the US because it hit I'm not even too sure about what happened no well the depression began in uh, November 29 I think with the stock market crash yes that's yeah. right yeah. that's right yeah, yeah. well I, I'm forgetting uh, I used to be, that used to reel off my tongue and I knew yeah. every fact and every figure uh, but it was the, the, the um, it, we had another GFC um, many years later, like the one in... What, 2007? 1987. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah. Sorry, right, yeah. Uh, but before that, in in 62, there was first a credit squeeze, you know. Um, but it's all to do with in international financial arrangements. Yeah. yeah. And um, But during, uh, when I was born, 
um, it was between the wars mm. uh, and um, the, the returned soldiers who came back from the 19, from the Great War, 14 to 18, they were never able to get on their feet because they came home and then, oh, they had the 20s, the Roaring Twenties, um, which began women's emancipation, you know, and uh, the flap, that was the flapper era. Mm. When my mother was a young girl, yeah. You know. Um, wow. Yeah, mum was born in 1901, so she, wow. uh, she she was a flapper during the 20s. She was 20 years old. Then. Yeah. Is that that's and, like the and, dancing? Is uh, it? Well, the Charleston came out of the flapper mm. era, and it was women's emancipation. They um, they always worn the Edwardian period was very um, well. Victorian, of course, was very closed up mm. uh, for women. The Edwardian period, they were still wearing long dresses. Um, it was the raising of the hems mm. to above the knee, <laughs> the era, is, yeah, and is, the Charleston, and women being able, uh, and then when the uh, the second war began, women, the men, or men didn't enlist; they were conscripted, I think. Or but anyway, the little so, yeah. country town I lived in, all the men left town and then enlisted in um, and became and, and into the services. Army, Navy, mm-hmm. or Air Force, and then women came out of the kitchen. There used to be a, a, uh, an expression about women keep them barefoot and pregnant. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Yeah. God. Yeah, uh, because they were the homemakers, and and men would come home and expect their tea to be on the table at six o'clock. Yeah. And even if women worked part time, which sometimes they had to to make ends meet, but uh, there was a bit of um, what subterfuge going on where. They didn't. It was rather demasculating for their husband to know that he wasn't the provider, mm. the provider. Not not. There was no. He had to be the provider, and uh, his wife had to be the homemaker, the carer, the carer, the, the, and the homemaker. And in if you're Catholic, then uh, with uh, contraception or anything like that, with all the religious aspect of it. Uh, friends of mine were having a baby. At least every two years, wow. but if they were um, not careful, you know, the babies would come along every eighteen months. And I knew one family that had a baby every year. Wow, jeez! Mm. And had to stay at home and look look after. Th- yeah, th- yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, even just the concept of like a great war is, mm. is amazing. You know, being born in ninety three. A world war. A world yes, war. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's ama- It really is quite incredible. Yeah. And I think. Um, you mentioned something before which I thought was interesting um, and then I'd like to get back to your upbringing but when you said that the men came back from the first war um, right back into it well I suppose it wasn't right back into a depression because it finished 1918 mm. but a couple of years after that mm. they had all that trauma um, mm. and the the night terrors and things there's mm. a specific phrase I'm looking for that I can't remember I, um, I might have misread you there there was a 10 year gap they came back in 1918 yes the the, the depression didn't start till 20, um, 29. 29. Yeah. So there, and that, it was known as the Roaring Twenties, and it was women's emancipation, and life, it was a total contrast of yep. that Twenties. Uh, Economic period. prosperity. Between, and they called it the, Between the Wars. Mm. Yeah, mm. Between the Wars period. And the Second World War started in 39. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so you would have been eight. I was eight when, um, um, yeah, um, the, the World War. I, I can remember... Um, we, we, my, my mother always had uh, had a shop and she always had a sub news agency and I can remember from eight years old reading the, the front page of the newspaper and it was pictures of what was going on in in the uh, what in the places of war where there were battles going yeah. on and I knew the 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 uh, the chief oh what would it be the so General Sir Thomas Blamey was the um, chief of the army. I don't. I forget the expression for it. Yeah. I don't even know. Yeah, <laughs> and I rem- this is that a little bit in, in the side. I've always been interested in. I remember making up my own crossword puzzle during the war. So I would have been well. I was eight when it started, and and fourteen when it. Uh, yeah, th- uh, well, I must have been. Uh, it ended in forty five, didn't it? So I was yep. um, seven, uh, um, fourteen when it ended. Yeah, but I'm making up a crossword puzzle, and the the answer to my first clue, which is who is the head of the Australian forces, 
Jen also Thomas Blamey wow. was my answer to that. And I remember making up the template with the making filling it making up the squares and filling some in black and some in white. Wow. And then making up the clues. <laughs> yeah. God. It, it, it just yeah. remind like the first thing it reminds me of is because I happened to be eight years old when nine eleven happened. Yeah. So I remember like what I remember specifically when about happened? 9-11. 9-11, yeah. September 11, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I remember um, something that mum and I talk about all the time, mm-hmm. uh, obviously your daughter, <laughs> um, is just watching her watching the TV because she didn't understand, she couldn't get it. And my world was my mum at the time. Yes. My, you know, um, seeing her trying to understand that planes can go into buildings was kind of what I remember. So it just reminded me of thinking of you like in a way that, you know, your crossword puzzle is a way that you try to conceptualise the... Uh, you know, global scenario is the same way that I'm doing that with mum, you know. Yeah. What was it like at the time? Like, was there a lot of nerves and it, it, when the war broke? Um, well, I didn't know. We were here in Australia particularly, and as a school girl, a school school, we were isolated mm. from Europe and from America. And because you grew up in the Northern Territory? No, I grew up in... I, I was born in a little country town in New South Wales, New South Wales. Woodstock. And um, then when I was six, we moved to another little country town called Stock and Dingle. Oh, yes. Um, and north of Woodstock is a, uh, another little country town called Cowra. And I remember I was baptised in Cowra. Wow. My baptismal certificate, I was known as baptised there. And Cowra was where there was a breakout, there was a con- um, prisoner of war camp there. Oh. I think they were Japanese prisoners, and there was the Kaura breakout at one stage. I, I, I should have, if, if I wanted to talk about this, I should have yeah. opened up on the history, but I didn't think I would be. Yeah, but um, uh, yeah, from, from age six, I, I lived in this little country town of Stock and Bingle and went to school there. And I remember when uh, I was eight years old when war broke out, and I can remember I used to be, I used to read the front pages of the newspapers. And always on the front page of the newspaper were these maps, too, of uh, what, what was going on in the front line. And I remember saying to my mother once, Mum, when there's not a war on, what is on the front page of the newspaper? <laughs> wow. And I remember her saying, oh, maybe the occasional murder. Really? <laughs> like, like, God. Yeah. That's, a, that's a pretty good response. Yeah. But it, it proves to me that I was interested in, in reading, in gathering information, As I said to you this morning, I regard myself as an information junkie. Mm. I just seek information everywhere. You you are one of the most uh, informative individuals I think I've ever met. Mm. Your ability to just talk about any topic. Someone could bring up, God, over the years, anything, and you'll have something to say that's credible and poignant, and that's unbelievable. Well, to to, to reach that point, you have to have... It something has to have sparked your interest, You've got to read up on it. You've got to decide which side you're on. Mm-hmm. You've got to form an opinion. So when the time comes to discuss it, it's got to be based on a well-informed, well-considered opinion. I think it's a waste of everybody's time if you just make a remark and then if somebody asks you a question and that's the end of the conversation because you haven't got anything to back up yeah. your opinion. Yeah. Well, that sort of behaviour doesn't make sense to me. Mm. And I can't be bothered wasting time by doing things by half measures. I think I think that is a bit of advice that uh, lots of people in this day and age should probably hear. Because <laughs> most, most, because you can just form, you can just, you know, put forward your opinion so easily in this day and age that no one really thinks about anything anymore. And they just go, oh, well, I don't think of this. So every opinion out there is just kind of like, especially on the Twitter sphere, you know, the Twitter sphere, Twitter. I, I've heard the word, but I really, I don't, I don't speak that language. Right. I'm, I, it's even, until you sent me that wonderful Facebook message, which you did on my birthday, I didn't speak Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, it's I'm a not, weird language. Te- technology does defeat me. Yeah. Because it's not reading, it's not singing, and it's not going to the movies. They're my three main interests, you know. Yeah. And um, I'm not totally backward with the technology. I've got my mobile. Mm. I can do text messages. You can do Skype. I can do phone calls. I can do... Well, I can look at Skype. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah. I wouldn't... Um, I. It's only when Peter brings me from, yes. from Vienna of course. that I need to press the button that says Skype. But he's he's on another 
um, Tons system now, which is called Hangouts. Oh, yes. So all Good. I have yes. to do is find something where he says, where he says, this is this is what you click on to, Mum. Perfect. So that's what I need. Yes. This is what you do. Simplicity. Or this is what you do, Grandma, and yes. I just press the button. Yes. Yeah. And I haven't got time. I, I haven't got time to learn mm. any more technology. Yes. Um, yeah. I've got too much other things to do. Yeah, and this is why I wanted to do this better. as well. You know, like I said, to record your memory and mm. you know show my grandkids, you know, yes, what yeah. you were like and yeah. how bloody with it you were <laughs> at eighty nine yeah. years old. It's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. It's so good. Yeah. So take us back to before yeah. I be, to be able to be where I am now. I have been so blessed with good health. Mm. Most of my friends suffer pain, mm. and I don't. Mm. And and I should be because I was mugged, as you know, in mm. two thousand and three, and I've got a totally reconstructed shoulder, and it's a, there's a wee bit of immobility, like I can't put my arm straight up, but it hasn't stopped me doing anything. Mm. Yeah, and um, yeah, you know, I I should be suffering pain for for, for things that have happened to me. And I've been, I don't. And I think being pain free is the secret of my success in being, uh, in my ability to get out of bed every morning and walk, mm. not be, ha and not have to use a stick. And I compare myself with, with friends of mine who used to be more agile than I was and still am. And one particularly has arthritis and can't move. Mm. Mm. Yeah. But don't you think that, because you know so much about nutrition, you know, I'm always asking you for advice about nutrition, mm -hmm. don't you think that your diligence to stick to a healthy diet has a lot to say about that? I, I think it, there's a, uh, that's an aspect of it, but I think the main one is genetics. Have okay. I touched on that yet? Yeah, like yeah. My, uh, coming from a healthy stock? Yeah. Or, uh, when my sister Barbara was dying, um, and we all went over to Adelaide to be by her bedside before she died. And uh, she survived for a lot longer than the doctors predicted. And um, I remember one of the doctors saying from me, uh, the Shields family, you come from healthy stock. Mm. And it, and this is this longevity that I talked about, yeah. with my parents and grandparents. I, I only know back to um, um, Mum and Dad's parents, uh, who were born at the beginning of the 19th, 20th, 20th century, century. Yeah. 20th century, and they all lived for so long. Now, is that in your genes, in your DNA? Um, yeah. Or is it, and my, the fact that I have eaten food that's contributed, either they say what you eat is what you are, well, all that healthy food I've eaten, I, I think. A lot of food provides calcium, which gives you strong bones. Maybe I've got a strong skeleton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I also, uh, it's posture. Even when I was waiting for you to pick me up this morning, mm. I was standing at the front. I went out early. Yeah. And I was standing out there for about 15 or 20 minutes. And I put my shoulders back and stood straight because it's posture that uh, keeps your skeleton uh uh, you know, in what's the word? <laughs> and there's the, that expression, the chakras, alive. Oh yes, align the <laughs> chakras. That yeah. But True. that's more philosophical, though, isn't it? But the, I think, um, it, I think, just even practically speaking, like when you stand tall with your shoulders back, you just feel a sense of um, comfort in your own skin, and it's also very good for yes, you. And yeah. I mean, I mean, evolutionarily, you can see more when you're taller up. Yes. So it yeah. helps us with our ability to mitigate threat in our acute environment. You know, so. See, this is why I wanted you on the podcast so badly is because all these things you do are just things that are now only really concretizing in terms of their mental and physical... Are what again? Concretizing. What's so, that? like, um, they're becoming concrete in terms oh, concretize. of their... Um, I've never heard of that word. Yeah, I, I You're think You're using it, concrete sure a word. noun as a verb. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's a word. We'll hope it's a word. If not, uh, See, semantics, we'll, we'll let it all this out. Semantics. If you say a word that I don't understand, I'll... I'll Take you to task. Yes, yes. I think it's a word. We can oh, concreting, that is a word. Concreting. People concrete by laying the concrete, don't they? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry about that. Tom. But I think concretizing is a oh, word as well, yeah. is the word that I Which use. Which word did you, oh, you use concretizing. concretizing. That's right. Yeah, concretizing an idea. Yeah. I hope so. Well, 
We'll have to edit this whole well, part out. Look up concrete and every... <coughs> I have fun reading the dictionary. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's these things that uh, people are now only really starting to grasp, and you've been doing them since the 40s. Yes. Like, that's amazing <laughs> to yeah. me, you know? Yeah. Um, we were talking about this in the car where I think, um, you know, where you think, sorry, a lot of your... Um, sense of well-being and you know personal meaning if you would say that comes from and you were uh, you were saying how you think it's important to be selfish first you know before you can be selfless oh, love yourself love yourself because first. Uh, not so much to be selfish, selfish. in terms of uh, grasping no no but no. It, it to uh, you've got before you can love anybody else you have to love yourself love yourself self-esteem yeah. is is what's important and then if you if you have self-esteem you can love the whole world, mm. yeah, and you're not judgmental on other people about the the uh, that is, it's a uh, to be non-judgmental is so important, yeah. and not to be other judging others by your own standards, not expecting other people to like what you like, to do what you do, just to live and that other wonderful statement, just live and let live. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So uh, apart from the Beatles. <laughs> Where, um, like, Pipe for the Beatles. well, I think that was, I was thinking of Let It Be, sorry, oh. not Live and Let Live. <laughs> well, I didn't that's know probably you were more, see, that's it. You James didn't, Bond. You didn't imp, um, what, impart to me what led you to say, apart from the Beatles, that was just in your mind. I know. Let It Be was a song of theirs. I know, I know, sorry. <laughs> not, there's that expression, TMI, too much information. Too much information. That was not enough information. Yes, yes, yes. N E I. Sorry to take this. No, that's all right. No, but it's this good. is where sometimes I think, I must have missed something. Yeah. Because I didn't understand the statement. But no. your, your assertiveness to be like, hang on, did I miss something? is probably yeah. part of the reason why you're so intellectual you know <laughs> but um yeah so you all that stuff about, about loving yourself first before you can give back to the world and mm-hmm. that is not that i don't think was very popularized back when you were starting to grasp that idea the thought, it was vanity well yeah in the catholic world yeah love god vanity. first yeah yeah why did you stick to that why did i stick to like like why did that idea stick with you anything that sticks with me is because it makes sense to me you know, and, and you have to be, there's another statement, this above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Mm. You know, and this is, the, you have to be true to yourself. It's no use me, uh, like even growing up in a, as, well, I took the Catholic religion seriously. It wasn't so much a strict household that I was brought up in, but when I was sent to be educated by the nuns and told, how to behave. I I never do anything by halves. I did it to the nth degree. Mm. But, uh, you know, that was where I learned this way to behave. But they were all... Um, it was all part of obeying God's will more than anything. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Your um, definition of God has morphed and changed a lot oh, since right. that time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was wondering if we could like enter into that conversation now a little bit. Yeah. How how did you see God at that time? When I was a child. Yeah. Well, I I thought about God in the way that the nuns and and le- to a lesser degree the priest. I only talked. Well, I hardly ever talked to a priest, but we would have a sermon during mass mm. every Sunday. And looking back on it now, they would they just take an excerpt from either the of. We didn't learn much about scripture. We just had an, uh, an excerpt from the New, Tes- the New Testament. Mm. And as I got, I, I didn't dare to, in, in my mind to criticise a priest or a nun because we were taught to, um, you know, obey them and respect them. Uh, but as I got older, I, I thought, you know, they're just, they've got their sermons written down and they'll just r- read the same thing periodically, mm. depending on the, the um, period in the church, like and all the different periods that we went through. I know that Advent leads up in, into Christmas, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I stopped going to church um, some years ago, but I, uh, and having faith in, in God, I, I read all I can of people whom I respect and what they write about spirituality, and I read Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, 
and a statement in that that he made and he himself was quite an arrogant man i remember one uh sentence he said i am writing this book because i know that god does not exist and i want to influence as many people as i can to agree with me mm. that and i thought the arrogance yeah. of the man but then again i like a person to be certain uh, you know in, in their belief and if they're certain about it they have every right to spread 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 their message but i thought that was the height of arrogance mm. but his statement where he said rather der- derisively and he was speaking ab- about an elderly woman had spoken to him and she obviously revered him and wanted to be helped by him mm. and even in his book which was made up of um interviews he'd had with people and so this elderly woman was quoted in this book and i read it and a whole lot of other people read it where she was asking him about faith and he said faith belief without evidence mm-hmm. as if anybody who would profess to having faith in something he's pointed out yes. that there you believe something yes. when there's no evidence to yeah. your belief that seemed to me that it was his arrogance and he's speaking derisively about this delightful elderly lady who was looking up to him you know that's the image I have in my mind um deferring to his greater wisdom I you don't know. think she wanted to be condescended no um and you know to your point as well because I've read the god delusion too and um you know the atheists, you know, the the popular atheists, are putting forward an argument that a 12-year-old could put forward. You know, when I was eight years old, um, I asked mum if there was a Santa, and mum said uh, she took it, she considered it, you know, and then she was like, oh, no, you know, it's dad and I. And then I said, what about the tooth fairy? And then she said, well, that's dad and I too. And then, and then I, and she said, and then I said, well, what about the Easter Bunny? She said, no, it's us again, you know. <laughs> and then I said, well, what about the the Stardust Lady? Because Mum would always tell me that at night a, a, a pixie or a fairy put stardust in your eyes, you know. Um, is that something that you said to Mum, by the way? Uh, Mum was quite. Mum, she, Mum, Claudia was only four. Yeah. And but the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, all and and she said, uh, her father must. Mum, what about God? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. C- Claudia brought God into it. Well, yeah. that, that was a puzzler. But see, that's my, the point, well, right? Did, so, did, when you were eight and Claudia, uh, and Claudia spoke to you as your mother, where did that, where, what was what was your last question? I, can't I thought remember. you were leading to that she was having, she was getting questions from you the same as she put to me. I, I feel like I might have brought God into the equation too. I'll have to confirm that with mum. Mm. But um, I've always been interested in God and life and all that sort of stuff, you know. But my, the, my point was, you know, Richard Dawkins and all the modern atheists are putting forward an argument that an eight-year-old or mum could have said, what about God, you know? Mm. And then his point about faith is belief without evidence. Well, that's true, but it's putting science on a pedestal. It's like science tells you what is. But human beings function um, through implicit action. We want to know how to act and how to be. Mm. And faith doesn't have anything to do with science. Faith has everything to do with the belief that if you, uh, you know, sacrifice what you most like now in the, f- in the present by working hard at something, for example, that a better future will come into being. So, for example, my hope is that you know, I have faith in this podcast because the result is something that I can give back to um, the community and my, my children, you know, mm. and that's what faith is. It's the hope in a better future. Yeah. You, you can't yeah. possibly have evidence yeah. that the future is going to be better because yeah. it's it's an illusion. But yeah. faith is a is an idea about action. It's, yeah. it's got nothing to do with scientific analysis. No, no. You know? And, and sci- because there's science and there's uh, philosophy... And and there are inexact science. There's another category, an inexact science. Mm. Well, could uh, what we're talking about be not quite philosophical? But I uh, I love being philosophical. I love anything to do with the mind. Mm. And of course, people we've discussed this today. 
people react differently. As some people, well, that lady revered um, uh, Richard Dawkins. I saw him on television mm. conducting these interviews, which eventually became his book. Yeah. Like he, he just uh, uh, printed them. And he's, he'd written a book, The Second Sex, yeah. earlier on, and I don't know what that was about. But I couldn't help but admire the man. I also saw him on television. He was on Q&A, you know, at yes. Q&A program one night. I've seen, I've seen that, yeah. yeah. And it was only whoever, I think it was Tony Jones Levy at the time, and him. And he was, uh, most people's perception of him is his arrogance and that he's cleverer than everybody else, you know, to go by He heart, thinks he's cleverer say. than, yes. And he, he's, very he's usually, he can rise above that and, and behave impeccably and uh, always... Uh, keeping us cool and answering questions rationally and, and scientifically, the the power in the room, what what the something in the room, Energy. it definitely wasn't the love in the room, it was <laughs> the opposite of the love in the room, was so powerful, I saw him change. Mm. He, his, he was brushing his hair, his hair became dishevelled, and he looked ill at ease to a degree up there, which shows that if you... Goes, you climb so high that you leave any support. Mm. You're bereft of any support yep. from, from the plebs, as yep. you might say. <laughs> You're out there on your own. And, and that that was that writ large with mm. him, him on, on camera. Yeah. And he, I just thought, oh, Richard Dawkins. <laughs> he, he can fall from a high place too. Yeah. Yeah, I think we all can. Yes. yes. Yeah. But I think what he's but been... But it was arrogance that did it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I think why he's been so important and he's been so important in my life as well is because he has um he's been all about critical thought you know about critical thought, critical thought which yeah. is something that you were doing obviously when you left the church mm. you know that idea that like you know no god is gonna is going to this should be a system that should ingrain me a, you know a positive belief system and you know if, if, if the thing is that i'm gonna go to hell if i if i you know, have sex before I'm married or something, and then like you know, stuff this. Yeah. Um, and you you impose critical thought upon your own belief system to get to that secular spirituality mm. approach, which mm. is brilliant. And I think that's what Richard Dawkins is really brilliant at. He's just encouraging people to think critically about yes. their own belief systems and lives. Mm. But I I agree with you that he he takes it too far, and he doesn't actually look. I, I think that he's happy to throw the baby out with the bathwater, yes. you know? Yeah. And it's like, well, religion, we wouldn't have got to today without belief systems and a sense of morality that is, you know, engendered from those. Um, it's important that now we abstract ourselves again and go, okay, is this still good and then continue to grow? It's not all bad because yeah. religion has provided people with a sense of meaning for thousands of years, mm. you know? Um but we don't have to talk about Richard Dawkins the whole time. But, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, but a couple of things you've said resonated with me there. Um, uh, when, you, uh, when you were talking about how I thought as a child, mm. I was reminded of that uh, from the epistles of St Paul, is it? When I was a child, I saw through a dark glass, a, a glass darkly, I thought as a child. Now I am adult and think differently. That's as when I was a child, I was indoctrinated, yep. sent to a Catholic school, uh, and I had I was told at four years old that if I disobeyed my parents or if I obeyed any of disobeyed any of the Ten Commandments, and there were venial sins and mortal sins, and like uh, thou shalt not kill is that the sixth commandment? <laughs> I think it actually is. Yeah, yeah, thou shalt not kill. Now, to murder somebody yeah. is a mortal sin yeah. of disab against the, that commandment. Uh, to smack somebody or hit somebody is a venial sin of that. But you went to hell, and at four years old, I was told that hell was a hole in the ground that y your, uh, and your physical body went to hell and you and th these terms are in the New Testament. I think you are devoured by the flames of hell. Now, a four-year-old, uh, this four-year-old, saw that, 
And there was a cartoon in the newspaper recently, which I've cut out to show to Claudia, because it has um, a, a, a pit, and this time it has stairs going down into it, with flames coming out. And I've, I've saved it to show Claudia, at four years old, that was my image of hell, but at the time I thought of it like if you, if you confessed and you were redeemed and saved, uh, it was like a snakes and ladders game. Mm. That and I had you, you know I mean snakes and ladders. You've got snakes going down into the pit and ladders that can get you out. And and when you play the game on the throw of a dice, yep. you go up the ladder or fo or fall down on. The snake. That is life to Christianity, yeah, isn't it? Came, that, that was my life when I was four. Mm. And this, maybe this cartoon was there because, leading to this podcast mm. when I could talk about it. Because I haven't had a chance to show it to Claudia and say, that was the image I had at four years old. And here, when I'm 89 years old, 85 years later, is that the math? Yeah. <laughs> 85 years old. Um, it's, you know, that's still that. And, and this was a cartoonist. And I don't know what he was talking about and uh, what the cartoon was talking about but um there goes the microphone oh. <laughs> that's all right I'll bring that back in a bit yes we're off the end <laughs> <laughs> um no but you're exactly right i mean that that's just clear psychological abuse yeah. to say that to a four-year-old um is literal abuse in mm. my opinion you know but everybody did it and, and it was in society as well as in 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 the church mm. uh, but as i told you earlier too that was one if if I, I, when Claudia and Peter were born, I thought if they're going to believe in God, which is what it's all about, you either believe that God exists or you don't. Um, and if they were going to be believers, it would be direct revelation from God. Mm. I was not going to influence them in any way at all. Mm. Mm. In, That's brilliant. Because I objected to. And, but I didn't blame mum and dad. Mum and dad did the right thing. They, had, uh, they were Catholics and it was... A commandment of the church. We have the Ten Commandments of God and the Six Commandments of the Church. Catholic parents send their children to Catholic schools. Now that that was the church playing power games. Yeah. That, that they get. They needed the money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then the young girls uh, who were brought up as a Catholic. And when I was fourteen, and I, being a good Catholic girl, I'd go to mass and communion every morning. And the local parish priest noticed that, so he told me. I had a vocation to be a nun and I knew that I didn't want to be a nun. I was quite happy to go to Mass and Communion every day but I didn't want to live in a convent and there were three, pardon me if I'm rabbiting on it. No, not at all. I love it. The, uh, uh, but these are things that I'm remembering about my attitudes when I was young. Um, uh, I knew there were three vows you take as a nun, poverty, chastity and obedience. obedience. I knew even, uh, I was 17 when all this was going on. Um, poverty, you're not poor because you know where your next meal's coming from. Chastity, there are no men around you. And, yeah. and uh, there are no books to read or anything like that. Everything is anything that would bring on impure thoughts. Yes. Really cool, uh, would be there. But for me to be obedient for the sake of obedience was ridiculous. Mm. Like if, um, and, and it was always Reverend Mother. We, we were obedient, and in our case, it was Reverend Mother Winifred. She was a, a lovely lady. I thought she was so old. Mm -hmm. she, was, she was about 40. You know? <laughs> they were all dressed in these habits, which the, the, the dresses and the cloaks and the, and that white, the wimple, that yeah, yeah. white collar, and every, and they had to have their hair shaved off in when oh, I was wow. young, but still wear everything. It, it was almost like the Muslims with just the eyes and the mouth. Yes, um, yes. And everything else covered. Uh, but wow. Um, I, wow. Um, uh, Reverend Mother, when, she was only 40 at the time. Her young niece came to the school and her name was... Um, at the, the, uh, her name was Frances, mm. um, this little girl that came to school. And she became a particular... I, to, she was in a class younger than me and I, it was a sort of a buddy system. I was asked to look look after her, you know. And I remember she had to say, Mother Winifred, her, her name was Frances too. That's a lot of odd information. <laughs> yeah, no, that's I, good. Totally unnecessary. It's yeah. fascinating. That, but it's just fascinating, but like, you know, that how 
how, um, you know, even like if you saw someone living like that today, like just given the society, how it's progressed, it's like, yeah. that's just bizarre, you know? And yet I'm talking to someone who lived that experience, yeah. you know? Because, I, yeah, I wanted to get back to the, um, the initial question, which was, how has your idea of God and spirituality changed as you've gotten older? Uh, well, it was so, I was so affected by the brainwashing, the indoctrination, and my personality, if there's a rule, I obey it. And I find it easy mm. uh, to do that. I don't have that rebel nature, you know. I, I find it easy to fit in, uh, be second in command. Like, my life is a secretary. Yeah. I never wanted to be the boss. I wanted to be indispensable to the boss, you know. I was always a very, very good secretary. Uh, your Grandpa. Your grandfather. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, I was his secretary, and he said he, I was the best secretary he had. Yeah. I, he ever had, and he was definitely the best boss I ever had. You know, we were both very good, good, at, good at our jobs at least. Yeah, we yeah. Didn't make much of a go of the marriage, but yeah. we were good at our jobs. I <laughs> often say to Siobhan that I'm, um, you know, I'm, I think I'm the best secretary she's ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I don't say that. But, no. <laughs> but but you you compliment each other. Yeah, for sure. What you're saying, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, just just careful you yes, put there, Grandma, with that one. the other knee. Yeah. No, there we go. Turn the other cheek. Cross <laughs> the other. <laughs> I'm not comfortable if, like, if I sit like that. Yeah. I just feel uncomfortable. I've always, I, I, yep. Yeah. And you know another stupid, silly statement that I used to hear from the nuns: "Don't cross your knees. It makes Our Lady blush." What does that mean? That's yeah. It means that uh, to you, for you to cross your knee, Our Lady, the Virgin Mary. That, did you know that Our, La- that the our Lady of... was referred to our, as yes. Our Lady? Yes, yes. as in Our Lady there was of our Lord. Jesus Christ was Our Lord and the Mother of Christ was Our Lady. Mm. Now, these are terms that just rolled off my tongue since yep. said four years old when I went to school. Yeah, um, And this is the reason why Claudia and Peter were not subjected mm. to that. Um, if, uh, uh, if that... Um, they did. I had. They were baptized because children have to be christened. Of course, and, yeah. And, uh, and I was still going to mass then, but I was like the Catholic Church had so many sins. Contra- well, that's the Contraception was a sin. You you weren't supposed to stop having a child if you got pregnant, and you, and you had to have it aborted. The child aborted. That was a sin. Mm. Uh, you couldn't you know, win. I know. Well, I I was still a good Catholic, and I wanted a nuptial mass uh, to be married to Fred. But I knew that when I went to mass and, and communion at the nuptial mass, that from then on I was going to have to practice abortion because I'd had cancer, and the, that pregnancy might clear up the cancer. I knew that I was going to commit every sin in the book. Yeah. What they what the church regarded since what to me was common sense. So I, after my nuptial mass, when I was married to Fred, I I became a non-Catholic. I didn't go, I didn't take the children to church, and I didn't go to church myself for 20 years. Mm. And it was only when Claudia and Peter wanted to be confirmed that they began to work in the church in in, uh, in various ways. Peter used to sing in the choir, and, and they were coming to church with me just because, uh, well, this must have been after the 20 years, uh, but but um, I've forgotten the time frames <laughs> now. But uh, um, it was Claudia and, uh, and Peter were confirmed, but I stayed away from the church for 20 years because I knew that, uh, oh, I know, Pope John the 23rd came in in 19... 19- in the 60s, so when the Claudia Vatican. was born, the Second Vatican Council, and all of those rules that I yeah. lived with were out the window. And I thought, this is a Catholic church that I could belong to, <laughs> yeah. And I, uh, yeah, and I became a, a pillar of one of the parishes in South Yarra. Oh, wow. I became the collector, a collector, <laughs> and I ended up down at the Priory every Monday morning for 19 years, from 1985, to 2004 when I left um, uh, South Yarra, going there, counting the money and taking it down to the bank. Wow. And I did that every Monday morning for 19 years and joined any fellowship group at the Catholic Church. 
Father John Barry, who died only recently, I went to his funeral last year, uh, he used to rely on me if he needed any, to help him in his pastoral work because he knew I had plenty of time, I might be retired by this time, mm. and uh, even if people were new to the parish, he'd like a parishioner to go and just welcome or have a cup of tea with them, uh, tell them all about what goes on at the parish, and he would say, Josie, he'd bring me and ask if I could go and visit them. Um, and one Japanese woman who lived in a posh um, block of flats down on Queen's Road, uh, she wanted help in learning English. Oh, wow. And she asked the priest for that help. And, and Father John asked me if I'd go down, and I went to her luxury flat and just listened to her reading from a book in the English language and pointed out where her accent, the emphasis was on the wrong, <laughs> as Claudia said, the emphasis was on the wrong style. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. I'm it's rambling amazing. on here. No, you're not. <laughs> This, as again, this is all about, so your memory is, stays with us, you know, and also because I just want to learn from you, you know, which is, which is really important for me. Um, and you were mentioning before you, um, and then the last topic before we move on from um, God, I suppose, but um, you and I have obviously discussed at length spirituality and philosophy, and we probably need to do that a lot more, you know, um, but um, you kind of take more of a secular look now. You know, a, look? a secular look. Secular, yeah. yes, definitely. Was upon spirituality. Um, you still pray and, and all that sort of stuff, but it sounds to me like it's almost more of a, a contemplation or like a meditation, perhaps. Yeah, and, and I've read in, in John um, Jordan's book, appreciation, mm. not supplication. Mm. And he says... Donald Walsh. Don, Donald Walsh, yes. not Richard Dawkins. Conversation with God. Ra Donald Walsh. Yes, he, yes. Uh, uh, and all spelt differently. Yeah. Than, yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, and, and which means all you have to do is be grateful. Mm. And to, and, uh, I, and I wake up every morning, and I used to joke, grateful that I had a pulse, you know, that I did wake up, yeah. Um, uh, but now I, I have taken that on board. I am so grateful for the wonderful life that I have and, and I don't have to take it take it any further. Mm. I did have a thought about something earlier, but, but if I don't sp uh, uh, verbalise a thought nowadays, it goes it out just of goes. my mind. But it will come back, I'm sure. It was to, um, uh, oh, no, it'll come back. It'll come back. It'll come and back. if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But yeah. see, even to your point, I think uh, gratitude for the pulse is, okay. is something that would help us all with perspective, you know, <laughs> just like even just to be alive, yes. having an experience yes. is something that, um, you know, myself included, is so important for us to remind ourselves of. It's like, hey, no matter how bad the job is or the boss is, I've got great bosses, but, you know, all this sort of stuff, like how bad, whatever's going on in your life, you're alive. Yes. You know, you've still got a pulse. Um and um, is this something you think of more now as you make your way to the 90s? Well, I wake up every morning and the thing I'm most grateful for is I'm pain-free. Mm. And I'm comparing myself with friends. Yeah. And uh, my, my two dearest friends. Uh, well, I wake up every morning with my list of people to pray for. Uh, first of all, Claudia, Peter, Tom, Laurie, like my family, mm. and my two sons-in-law, my two wonderful <laughs> sons-in-law, David and, and Tony. Uh, but then it's uh, Julie, who is totally blind. Oh, yes. I wake up every morning and I think I open my eyes and I can see. Mm. Julie opens her eyes and she can't see. She is the most intelligent. Um, she she lives alone in a two-story, three-story um, home that her late husband built. He was wow. a, um, in construction, as she says, and he built it. And uh, they had such a wonderfully happy marriage of so many years. And uh, we lost uh, Rob about six years ago. He had a stroke and died. She still lives in this house on her own. She gets help from, she has family and friends. Uh, but she is so, oh, what's the word that means you can get along on your own? Uh, independent. Um, independent. Uh, but she uses help when, when she needs it but it's her intelligence shines through she listens uh, 
she listens, uh, she says, oh, I saw this on television. She's, she's listening to it, she's hearing it, but she can she remembers what the characters looked like and, and so forth. She's totally blind now, but in the years since I've been going and seeing her every Friday, I'm her girl Friday. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, Friday girl. And but, yeah, yeah. You know, from uh, Robin, Robinson. Oh, no. Ra- uh, my, my, um, Robins, a, a traveller called Robinson had his Man Friday. Right. Which was a, um, a, a native of the place where he lived, used to work for him, I suppose. Oh, right. And the girl Friday in an office became an assistant, you know. Yes. But I turned that into, because I only worked on Friday. Right. Then when Peter was, I heard Peter telling one of his kindy mates when he was little, oh, my my mum's a girl Friday, she only works Friday. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> now, I've deviated again, which I... No, 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 that's all right, that's all right. Shouldn't do, yeah. But no, like, again, yeah. it's just, it's, because um, I'm always very interested, I try to, like, I'll listen to what you say, because I want to have a life like yours, you know, I want to get to, like, 89, 90, and, and be able to wake up pain-free, you know, good, healthy mind, yes. health, body and soul. And gratitude. Is, well, I was yeah, just going to say, that's it. you, you implore gratitude. gratitude. Yes, yes. I think that's your biggest, um, yeah. I think that's the best tool in your toolbox. Yeah, well, I have big... so much to be grateful for. And when I was talking to PK at David's um, party recently, he said that what he, uh, I, I knew you spent a bit of time when he was um, doing some handyman work on a PK yeah, yeah, yeah. and we talked a bit. And uh, he said, the thing that about you that impressed me, he said, you have a curious mind. Mm. Now, isn't that wonderful? It is. And I know. But then again, as I was saying to you this morning, other people say you ask too many questions. So you've got to find a, uh, a happy medium between having a curious mind rather than idle curiosity. Yes. You know, just asking questions. But if, if I do... I, I, I just don't want to hear something and leave it. Mm. I, I want to... No more. I I have a, my mind is curious as to know more about the subject. Mm. Yeah. And and you think that's lot like just temperament, because curiosity is so a personality. personality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Which my, is so which good. Which is my temperament. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Grandma, what do you think? Um, people that are my age, um, you know, that are just kind of like coming. I'm I'm twenty six. You know, still have hopefully a few more years in the bank at least. But um, just I suppose like. A good well, bit of advice. It's a lot, lot, a lot right. better in forward on a better basis than Martin is. Yeah, yeah, true, <laughs> yeah. true. Um, what what is like a, a guiding force or an idea or something that you live by that um, you know the youth of today could really benefit from? Uh, uh, there was a uh, the the expression that I was um, thought I'd lost before it oh, yeah. came back to me just as we were talking. Uh, and it's one that I love. And I remember you standing in the, uh, when I had my little self-contained flat at SQ, you were just inside the front door. And I remember saying to you, Tom, there's an expression from the New Testament. And I think I've mentioned one earlier today, but this is the one that I appreciate most. Christ said, love one another as I have loved you. I think that's a maxim to live by. Mm. Yeah, mm. and 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 because th- uh, before I was mentioning love as self self love and self esteem, maybe that was another, uh, and I've forgotten now what I said about that. But this is the one you asked me when you were a teenager, and I have this image of you standing in 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 in, in the hallway just inside my front door, and uh, you said to me, you asked me. Um, what what's my favourite saying from the gospel? I was when we were talking about spiritual matters, yeah, and uh, Christ. Uh, and as Christians, we follow in Christ's footsteps, and that that's how I think of religion now. Oh, and I did see um, a film about Martin Luther. Oh yeah, and uh, he he was the one who, uh, growing up Catholic, it was always spoken of derisively as he. Pinned yeah. a, something on a wall with a nail and ran off with a nun. Yes. But I learned uh, when I was in uh, Vienna with um, Peter's fiance at the time, she showed me um, a DVD, it would have been, I suppose, about Martin Luther. 
And what he did was the priests were using the money taken from the poor to build edifices to themselves. And what he wrote on, on that list, it was a list of 96 items, and I've forgotten now what they were, but it was about what the priests were doing, yeah. which was against what they were supposed to be doing, looking after the poor. And he pinned, uh, and uh, uh, we learned as Catholics so uh, derisively and unkindly was, he ran off with a nun. He, he didn't do that, but he went back, after he had pinned that notice on the wall, he went back and preached to his people. Um, and But he did, in this movie that I saw about him, he was incarcerated for many, many years and he transcribed the Bible from the Hebrew into the German language. And wow. in this movie, one of the young seminarians, when he was released from jail, he went up to him and thanked him and said, you have given us the Bible, you have translated it into our language so we could read it. I learned such a lot about Martin Luther in that movie. I, I want to, I'm going to Google that mm. and watch it again because he was the one who went back and, be, and uh, for, uh, uh, um, he was the one that I think of when Christ said, Love one another as I have loved you. Mm. That's what Martin Luther preached. Mm. Yeah, it's I think such I've a lost simple some continuity there, but uh, no, but it's such it, a simple it's idea. About, don't preach to people; just love one another. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's such a simple idea, you know. And I think simplicity is um, often rooted in cliche, and then cliche gets lost because everyone's like, "Oh, it's such a cliche." But it's like, yeah, but. For a reason. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's so important. It's a basic truth in a way or a basic fact. Yes. To do a large one. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, do you have any, uh, so, do you, because you're still very social, still, uh, now you're no longer the president of the book club, are you? Is that what you were calling oh, the president? My book club. Well, I've been in the book club for 54 years. Yes. Sorry, it was a month old when it started. Two books a month. There, uh, yeah, that's the one. Amazing. Two, there's, there's, that's, there are no presidents in that. Right. I'm one of three people who were there at the beginning. Yeah, Francis and Patricia and I, um, we were uh, we were there at the beginning. And um, yes, we were. Well, I try to read two books a month, but uh, quite if you didn't read them all, sometimes you'd only be able to read half of them. Sometimes you couldn't get the book. But uh, over the years, in when I was working full time. But then I could read till two o'clock in the morning and still get up bright eyed and bushy tail and go to work. Bushy Nowadays, <laughs> at about uh, half past ten, I will, if I'm reading a book, I just go to sleep. But these days, uh, I also, I'm, uh, as well as doing the crosswords in the past, I read to newspapers. Yeah. And I, uh, some people say, you read the Herald Sun, that trash. You know? <laughs> well, it's got information in it that I'm interested in True. absorbing in the same way as the age. And Two I, sides. I do the, the, the crossword in the age, the, the synonyms, the normal synonyms in the age and the Herald Sun. But I also do the cryptic one in the Herald Sun because it's a little bit easier than the one in the age. If I did the one in the age as well, I wouldn't have time to do anything else but crossword puzzle. But every evening, and again in the morning if I've got time, that takes up so much of my... But see, that I'm learning new words. That's semantics. Concretise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And also, too, I'm, because of this, I'm never bored. Mm. Yeah. You've mm. always got something to keep your mind occupied. Yeah. Do you have anything else that you like to do in life? Like, do you have goals that you Going like? out and having lunch. Going oh, out yes. and having fun. Actually. Well, we can do that. <laughs> Going we can out do and that. having fun, yeah. 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 But um, yeah, I try to keep a balance between... Um, seriousness and light-heartedness uh, but the main thing is I keep getting back to it I'm so lucky to belong to a loving family and to be pain-free mm. and I'm comparing myself with my friends uh, all of that and also to later uh, um, because of my age a whole lot of people of my contemporaries are dying mm. or becoming incapacitated in some way I have yet to have um, my, like the thought of losing Claudia that would be, uh, I don't think I could ever get over it. Mm. I haven't lost, I haven't had that great tragedy yet. And so many of my friends have. Mm. I've been saved 
from, oh, I've been, what's the word? I haven't yet had to experience the terrible grief of losing a child. Uh, and it was a natural course of events, me losing my parents. Mm. And my all, both my parents and my grandparents lived to an old age, mm. you know. So mm. uh, there's been no great tragedy in my life. And I think at, when I wake up every morning um, with this prayer of gratitude and going through my list of people to think about, because, and two friends, Tina and Mandy, two of my best friends, and with my best friends, they have this element of spirituality. We can discuss those inner convictions, those personal matters, whereas a lot of people, you, you know that say religion and politics, yeah. don't discuss it all. Well, with both Tina and Mandy, but I don't like to categorise friends into best friends. Of course, of course. But these, there's the longevity there. I've known them both for longer than most of my other friends. But I am also in so many clubs and there's a, a core group emerges from every club I'm in where we meet and have lunch. And as far as I'm concerned, we have fun together mm. because having fun is so important. To be lighthearted and to be um, just to not to be bogged down feeling sad. You, you, you've got to try and lift yourself out of it. But then again, I haven't had that tragedy, which I know would weigh me down. Mm. You know, yeah. But you're, yeah, you, you do have such an optimistic take on life, which I think is uh, few is and far between. Is Aquarian? Aquarians are supposed to be. If you take any notice of, I'm oh, sorry, I interrupted no. you. Talk, you, there. The, uh, you know, the star signs. Yeah. And anybody who puts much credence in them, you know, what, how, how many people are, seven billion people in the world? Seven and a half, I think. Seven and a half billion. Yeah. Twelve signs of the zodiac. Yeah. And, you, you know, we're supposed to fit in there. Right. <laughs> what they say about um, Aquarians here, they're optimistic. I've got a mug that somebody gave me with an Aboriginal um, mot illustration on it. And they say about us, idealistic, eccentric. <laughs> we are the weirdos. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the eagle that soars where others cannot. Mm. Now, I love that. Which means true. We, we rise above things and, and try and have an overview of things. And to me, Aquarians are mostly, uh, they love the whole world, but they don't want people, they're loners, basically, the indep value independence. Now, here am I saying, if you put any credence in star signs, I know well, everything about Aquarius. You are. <laughs> don't ask me about any of the other. Oh, Capricorns, I know, because Fred and Claudia are both in, in, uh, in January. January. Um, they're the hedonists, but the uh, uh, Capricornians and my two are uh, my two Fred was Claudia is prepared to work hard for any of the good things of life. Mm. You know they don't expect anything to be served up on them on mm. the plate. Yeah, the Claudia's so like Fred. Oh, I think she inherited she inherited her looks from him. Yeah, and uh, um, you know I in the way she behaves, the way her reaction to things, she's a father all over again. Yeah, yeah. all the good parts. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. Well, Grandma, I think what I've taken from this conversation is just like uh, a deep sense of gratitude spirituality to the degree that you feel comfortable in yourself and you're open to cr thinking critically um you know eating for nutrition good body keeping the mind active um crossword puzzles constant reading and being curious and um this is like the five tips from my grandma on how to live a long happy life um having fun and having fun with friends yes. and having fun with how you live life and i think it's it's amazing to me how like simple they are you know but you have you you've got yourself to 89 and you are in no way shape or form ready to stop and um you know these are things that people my age could could really benefit to hear from because they're so entrenched um in like working and getting to the next level and all these things and you just been able to kind of navigate through all the ups and downs cancer included and um and but rice I survived it survived it yeah, yeah. exactly Great yeah survivor yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely the mugging and, I and the mugging it. yes absolutely. and the broken marriage and the broken and marriage and survived that and it didn't impact on the children yeah yeah yes yeah. yeah well yeah. yes all of these yeah. things yeah. um that is incredibly inspiring and I, I would have killed myself um time and time again if i hadn't 
had the opportunity to talk to you and obviously I love you very much you're an incredible inspiration um, a real a real a real friend as well because you know you've helped me um, explore my spirituality more than anyone in the family I think really just our conversations over the years um, you've read my writing which has been awesome and uh, I just love having you as a grandma mm. thank you Tom that, that lovely remarks mm. yeah. with the your book you remember it was the punctuation. I, I, I spent most. You helped me the most with the punctuation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm a stickler for grammatical um, and and the proper use of punctuation. Yeah. yeah. Grandma, I just wanted to uh, finish the conversation mm-hmm. with one little thing. You touched on it before in terms of the love um, one another as I have loved you. But if there was um, maybe if it, maybe it's something different, or maybe you want to say that again, that's fine. But if there was some lasting advice, you know. Um, that you would embark upon the world uh, based on the way you've lived your life, uh, what would it be? Did I mention this before? Look to your own behaviour and have no expectations of other people. Mm. Don't be judgmental, but behave well. Mm. And don't be judgmental and don't expect anything of other people. In uh, I, um, in, in, um, I remember when I first formed this idea in my mind uh, don't don't expect people to agree with you on subjects uh, be prepared for argument or debate is a better word and uh, don't expect people to like you because mm. people just um, will look um, they make up their mind that they don't like somebody based on observation or whatever I've gone on for too long no no not at, all, not at all yeah but uh, yes, um, I think that it is behave well yourself, and 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 have no expectations of other people. I suppose that's that's a good behave well. Yeah, love. yeah. Grandma, love you very much. And love I you very love much. Him more. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> Cheers.